Good morning. On behalf of the Alliance of Women and Workers' Compensation, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is entitled New Skills for 2023 and is a live panel session being broadcast today, March 23rd, 2023. Before we get started, I would like to thank our 2023 corporate sponsors for their support on hosting events such as this. They support us not because they want their logos up on a screen, but they support the cause, which is to affect positive change in the workers' compensation industry through networking, supporting, mentoring, and collaboration. The Alliance is inclusive of all professionals in workers' compensation, regardless of career stage, with the belief that we can all learn from and support each other. Our theme this year is Together Towards Tomorrow. Please be sure to head to the Alliance website for all upcoming events. We're excited to be hosting webinars, collaboration sessions, and in-person events throughout the year. Be sure to check back on our website for registration details. If you cannot make one of our virtual or in-person events, don't worry. All events will be recorded on, on demand for our followers. The Alliance grew so much in 2022, and we have launched several new chapters. Be sure to connect with your local ambassador for upcoming events to kick off your year with the Alliance. If you would like more details on the ambassador program, please check out a replay of our January panel where we highlighted the plan for 2023. Change is preceded by trust. It is through acceptance and inclusion that trust will be formed and positive impact will occur. The Alliance is committed to creating a safe space in the workers' compensation industry for women of diverse backgrounds and experiences through a shared culture that integrates various perspectives. This is who we are and who we will be. The time to do better and be better is now. The Alliance understands diversity is a journey that will take time to make meaningful changes for our organization, our followers, and supporters. We will be intentional in making progress along our key pillars of change. Turning to today's webinar, whether by choice or if we are forced into it, our worlds have changed dramatically over the past three years. This could be personal as well as professionally, but in the work comp industry in particular, we have all seen and needed to adapt to the changes around us and how we work. This session will focus on tangible tips for new skills we should either be considering or taking off of the shelf in 2023. Whether you have evolved to a remote, hybrid, or fully in office model, you will walk away with suggestions on how to gain skills necessary to succeed. Our panelists today are Stephanie Neuenfeld, Regional Workers' Compensation Claims Director of EMC Insurance Companies, and Cheryl Wilson, Workers' Compensation Claims Manager, Darlene Ingredients. As this is a live session, please comment and ask questions using the chat feature on your screen. Our panelists are happy to engage and answer questions, and we love seeing our members interact with each other during these sessions. Thank you so much for the time you're spending with us today, and we hope you enjoy this webinar. All right, hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel new skills that we need in 2023. Uh, my name is Lori Fry, and I will be talking to our two panelists today. And I'm super excited to get to this topic and, and talk through this and have some great takeaways for everyone who is joining us today or watching on demand later. Um, but first, I, before we get started, I want to remind everyone the chat is live. I did see there's already some participation in there. So that's great. Um, Someone here didn't support Cheryl, love it. So definitely keep the, uh, the chat going and we will get to your questions as, um, as we see them come through. So I wanna start with some introductions of who, uh, and thank you everyone for, uh, for definitely jumping in the chat. That's great, we, love, we really do love to see that and see you guys engage with each other. So um, with that, let's get some introductions and find out who these lovely panelists are to talk about this topic today. So if you guys could let us know who you are, your background, as well as just kind of why this topic is generally important. So Stephanie, let's start with you. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name again is Stephanie Neuenfeld. Um, I have been in the insurance industry for 15 years, um, five years working in workers' compensation with EMC Insurance. Uh, prior to that, I was in social work and that was my background. Um, I live in Wisconsin. It's a little gloomy and rainy here today, but I am so excited to be a part of this. Um, I'm married, have three kids, which includes two teenagers as of yesterday. Uh, we have two dogs, a guinea pig, a tortoise, so we've got a full house. Um, I, but I'm so passionate about this topic because I think over the last years, there's been a lot of focus on some of the anxiety and stress and these major changes that have happened um, 
to you know the world in itself, but also in our industry. And so I'm just excited to talk about a little bit of the growth and um, all that I have learned through this and some of those things that have been positive um, that have been able to come out of this experience. And I'm happy to share that with all of you. Great. Thank you for that. And Cheryl, mm -hmm. how about you? Um, hi, everybody. My name is Cheryl Wilson. I'm currently um, the work comp clinics manager for, for Darling Ingredients. I've been in the industry since about 2002, um, pretty much worked my way up from being a claims assistant um, and uh, from the in, um, ingester aspect of it to uh, management. Um, initially, before I was in the claims industry, I was in law enforcement. Um, that's a whole nother story. But anyway, um, as far as the topic, I'm very passionate about this particular topic because this was a this was something that we were all thrown into because of COVID. And so a lot of people, you know, if somebody has an outgoing personality, some people it, it was harder to deal with being in the house and all four walls surrounded with all four walls. And so I don't think a lot of people maybe talk about how the mental aspect of it is is affected. And so this topic will help us to kind of get some coping mechanisms on how we dealt with it, being thrown into it and having to be at home for, for three years and then having to adjust to maybe possibly going to a hybrid environment or back to a, um, or back to a, in working at home. Um, I have a beautiful 28 year old daughter who is actually an elementary teacher. Um, that's my only child. And I have a fur grandbaby, a little Shih Tzu. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, love the, uh, the, both of you, your backgrounds prior to work comp too. That's going to be a whole nother panel someday. Yeah, I was going to say, we, we, we could talk, we can probably I know, talk. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, also want to agree with one of our comments in there, the, the pink blazer looks great, Stephanie. So, uh, oh, thank you. Great thank you. Today. Um, and actually you both touched on in your intros, really fantastic things that I wanted to get to today. Stephanie, the, the positive aspects of this, because I do think a lot of times we just kind of fall into like. All, thinking of all the negative that that can come out of these things. And then Cheryl, exactly with you, the coping mechanisms, because you got so, not not you personally, but I'm sure people on this call got so used to one way. And then all of a sudden it's like, nope, back to this and trying to, to, to do that. So this is a really, really great intro into this topic because, you know, I think um, just to kind of kick it off, I think everyone who is joining us today, whether live or on demand, they had to be impacted in their work environment in some way. There's no way that anyone got around that in these last three years. And then whether it stayed in that way or went back to completely the way it was before, that's where we start to see those kind of the varying degrees of where people are needing to, to think through how they are in their work environment now in 2023, regardless of what that looks like. So just to kind of kick it off for you guys, just kind of at a very basic level, can you each tell me how did your work environment change? What were you doing on March 13th, 2020 that now it looks completely different, you know, three years later? And Cheryl, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, what I was doing was I was actually working at Brinks as a claims analyst in the office um, every day. And I was also working part-time as a package handler at FedEx Express, just to give me an extra free paid workout. So, um, I actually worked the full time during the pandemic, but with with FedEx as a part time package handler. But Brinks sent initially; they sent us home, and it was just like you're going to be working from home. It's like I don't want to work from home. I I need to be around people, and so for me, it was an adjustment to actually be going from an office to now you got to stay at home. So that means that not just staying at home. I had to adjust. I had to buy a desk. I had to get my room set up. I had to you know just basically pretty much changed my whole outlook on it. I had no choice but to stay at home because we could not come back into the office. And so it was an immediate mental, physical, everything adjustment. And so, you know, you had no choice to adjust un unless you win the lottery and could stay at home. But uh, but I had to adjust and it was it was an okay adjustment. I, initially, I didn't like it. Um, I grew to like it because I didn't have a choice, but then I still missed being around people. So for me, um, it was it was an adjustment. And so- um, I just had no choice but to adjust. What about you, Stephanie? Well, how did your work environment change? Yeah, so um, at that time, I was a supervisor of a team of five with EMC Insurance. And when kind of everything closed down, I ended up uh, at that time, my husband worked from home. Uh, we had a smaller house, uh, hadn't moved yet. We moved during the pandemic. So at that time, we had three kids uh, home 
doing their homeschooling, both of us trying to work in this small house together. Um, and so, yeah, I would not say it was an easy tra transition for me. I, I had many days with kids who were frustrated. I was frustrated um, and uh, I couldn't wait to get back to the office. But then as time went, uh, we kind of got into our groove. Obviously kids went back to school, things like that. And then it transitioned to, I was kind of lonely um, being by myself. So hence two dogs came into play. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I went through all the emotions really. And then after a while I um, accepted a position as a regional director. So now I've got 45 people that I'm working with. So big change mm -hmm. in what I was doing. And so I needed to get back to the office. But at that point I had gotten comfortable at home. So it was really a big transition again for me to get back out into the world. I loved being with people. I loved talking to them, but I got used to this situation. Now I was changing it again. So currently our office is in a very hybrid. Um, people have the choice whether they want to come in or not. I come in a few days a week. I engage with a few people that are here. Um, but we really went from, you know, lots of activities in our office, everyone here to now we've maybe got a handful of people here every other, you know, every other day. So big changes since the start to where we are now. So, yeah. And I think that's probably pretty common for a lot of people joining us today, going fully home and then probably a little bit like you're saying that hybrid and people can kind of come and come and go as they please. So I think both of you did mention what I, you know, I, I drew from that, what I think you both had the most difficult pieces for you. So Cheryl going home and, and not being around people and then Stephanie maybe being around too many people at home. Um, but so how did you each, how did you stay positive as you were dealing with those struggles or you know, even having to buy a desk or set up what your office looked like or, or working through what that was gonna look like? How did you stay positive? And is there anything that you learned in, in coping with that that you think would be it's good advice for anyone who is having a giant change like that. And so Stephanie, I'll go to you first. Um, I think just focusing on the things I could control, really. I mean, I couldn't necessarily control the fact that I needed to stay home every day or the people coming and going or working from the same space, but I could control um, how I managed my time. So some of what I think has been a positive through this is I've really learned and uh, found a great appreciation for the flexibility of my day. I have the advantage of hey, I can work a little bit earlier before my family even wakes up. And then I get to still take my kids off to school and have that little bit of time and connection with them. And then I can get back to work then when they get off the bus and I know it's a little rowdier, sometimes that's the time I'll log off for a little bit, I'll come back on later. Um, and so I've been able to kind of manage my time and set my schedule to really work for me and my family. And that's been a huge thing that's motivated me to keep going, to keep um, learning, to keep growing in my career. Mm -hmm. How about you, Cheryl? Um, a little bit to piggyback kind of a little bit on what um, Stephanie said. Some of the things I did learn to appreciate from being at home was the, the time factor and doing little things that I could do for myself. Um, and one other thing, one of the main things that I did learn from being at home is you have to make sure that you always maintain some type of positive thought process. Like, you know, if you used to, you know, you can't always think of it as being negative. And if you do have a negative thought, for me, I have to off offset it with a positive thought because if you don't, that will consume you. And so I learned to just basically respect the fact that, okay, you, you're at home, enjoy this time. You know, I'm, I'm at home, you know, it may sound crazy to some people, but I love the fact that I was able to use my own bathroom. That was that was like a big plus plus for me. I'm at home and can use my own bathroom. Yes, I don't have to share. So that was that was a that was a happy moment for me. So love it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then you just you know maintain positive. At least even if you're at home, you know reach out to your friends that are ex actually at home on Zoom. Take your lunch breaks. Go outside. Get out of the house. Walk around for 15 or 20 minutes. Do if you're in inside, don't stay in the house all of the time. Do something to keep your mind flowing and so you can just be be active and just maintain a positive thought process because it is a lot to be at home sometimes for, for some people when you when you do feel lonely yeah and sure. I think well what Cheryl had said too like setting that time aside sometimes for me like I actually put that time on my calendar 
Like I'll put a, a reminder on my calendar at 11 to go for a walk around the block because otherwise you get so, you know, ingrained in what you're doing and you're busy and people are messaging you and emailing you and you could just sit for the whole entire day. So getting that reminder to pop up to go, hey, do something for yourself, go for a walk because overall it's, it's better for you than just sitting all day and trying to grind through everything. So I, that, that's really a great tip. Great advice, Stephanie. Cause I think, you know, if, if you're thinking about what your day in the office, if someone stops in and, you know, chats at your desk for 10 minutes or so, you're not, you know, actively sending emails, you're engaging with that person. Or if you're going to just get coffee, all these things that are encouraged at, at, in the office to step away, to go get coffee, to go. And then I think when we get home, we all have that mindset. We have to be in front of our computer the entire time to make sure that we are working. I was like, but if you're in the office, you have those times when you're stepping away. So remembering that me time, I think that that's really great. And Cheryl, I think your bathroom comment makes perfect sense. Um, my <laughs> similar situation, I actually got Invisalign right before COVID and I hated being in public with it. And then oh, I didn't wow. have to be for a long time. And then when I did go out, I was wearing a mask. So no one even knew. So, um, I mean, just little things like that, finding those positive opportunities. I think that that's such a great way to keep your mind in a good space during those big changes. So what skills did you guys already have coming into this situation that you think helped from, from day one? Obviously, you know, some other things you might've picked up in the last three years, but what were some things that you had worked on or that you knew were good skills of yours uh, going into this that you think helped you not fully panic when it started? So Cheryl, I'll, I'll start with you. I can already tell based on knowing you that you, that positive attitude, I'm sure you had prior to 2020, but uh, any other skills that, that helped you just in the very onset? Um, I guess one of the other skills I could say, no, knowing that it was not going to be a permanent situation, I knew eventually we were going to have to go back to work mm -hmm. and actually accepting already accepting in my mind, okay, this is not going to be like this forever. Some people may were okay with wanting to stay at home, but in my mind, I already put it in my mind that you're going to eventually have to go back to work. So don't get used to sitting at home, working in a, in a, in a blouse for your Zoom meeting and pajamas in the bottom. You're going to have to wear full clothes to go back to work. So I, I made sure that I kept that in the back of my mind that you're going to have to go back. And to, that that helped me to to stay positive, knowing that I was going to eventually have to go back in the office. It wasn't going to be a permanent situation. It also helped me. Um, one of the things that helped me was just basically knowing or, or learning more about myself. And like I said, maintaining yourself, my positive attitude. That's something that I've always tried to do for a, a long time. And I try to keep that and keep that positive mindset. Um, just just simple things like that helped me in just being positive, knowing that I was going to go back. Uh, how about you, Stephanie? Um, well, one thing that I think really helped me is um, I tend to try to be really creative and try new things. And some are great and some are not. <laughs> um, but I have continued to use that throughout my time now in a, in a bigger leadership role as well. So um, trying new ideas. Uh, I did a who's who and had people uh, have pictures of themselves with their family, favorite quotes, bucket list items to really engage and get to know each other on that level because we're not here in the office talking to one another. Um, we've done music bingo to just have some engagement and fun. So it's not necessarily work, but it's about building that relationship with one another outside of the work too. Um, I also did like for uh, Women's Month, uh, I've been having people tell me inspiring women and send me pictures. And then I put those together and send them out to everyone. So again, just ways to engage, but also in things that are positive and uplifting and just building those relationships. So on those tougher days, you have people to count on and lean on and talk to because you have that safe space to do that. I love that. I don't know what music bingo is, but it sounds great. So I love it. <laughs> So then switching then to the topic, the, the title of this webinar, the new skills. So that's what you guys came in with, having the creativity and the positive mindset going into it. But what were some new skills that you realized you either did not have at all and needed to have some self-awareness develop or just hadn't really needed to use in the past? And so Stephanie, I'll go back to you on that. So I have two things, one of them being um, kind of from a tech perspective, uh, we started utilizing OneNote. And I don't know if everyone has OneNote or not, but we have really found that to be a way to keep things organized, to have clear communication, 
Um, you can build it out as much as you want, but for each of my supervisors that I work with, we have a OneNote that we share. So it's got their team members and them. And then when I have one-on-ones with them, we type the notes in there at the same time as we're talking. It holds us accountable. It brings up action items. I'll write notes in there about people going on vacation next month so that I can ask them how that went. Because again, when you have so many things going on in your professional and your personal life, it's hard to keep track of everything. But I do want to make sure that I'm knowing who those each person is as a whole. And I want to make sure that I acknowledge that. And so using some of those tech tools to help you do that goes a long way. Um, the other big thing that I would say was more of a, a relearning or continuing to learn is self-compassion. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself. I work really hard. I want to make people happy. I want them to be happy to come to work. Um, but everything I do doesn't always work out perfect. Um, I definitely am new to this leadership role. And so I'm going to make a lot of mistakes and having that self-compassion and being able to learn from a mistake and put it down and move forward and try new things um, it is something that I'm continuing to grow and, and learn as I'm in this new role and in this new environment. I love that. I think that's definitely great. And based on the comments, one note is apparently a really great tip for anyone who's not already using it. <laughs> the self-compassion, I think everyone could use a little more of that. I think that that's a really great call out. How about you, Cheryl? What are some new skills for 23? Um, new skills. I, I would definitely agree with, with, um, with Stephanie. One note has literally like become one of my best friends now. Uh, I was like, I just created a whole, it, it's very, it's very useful, very user-friendly, very helpful. And um, I shared it with a prior team member that I had. I had shared my one notebook because it helped keep organized. You can just put stuff directly from the email into one note and organize it. And so that was something that is a, a definitely a new skill for me because it's more, I'm not a tech guru, but you did learn anybody who was offered these three years learned some type of technology. And it may not be a pro at it, but you had no choice but to learn it. Um, I got a little bit more proficient with Zoom, WebEx, and every other thing that I can look at people on the screen with. Um, and one of the other things that to me that I've learned is that because we're dealing with so many people and this, this affected people many different ways, I've learned to be more cognizant of, of listening to people more instead of just, just hearing. I actually hear them and listen to them. And also when you respond to people, at, at least for me, I make sure that I do try to respond with empathy. And I think a lot of people would, benefit if they learn to appreciate empathy and, and truly understand what it means in the workplace and when you respond to people and when you talk to people, because I think that makes a lot of difference because you don't know what the way you respond to people, if you respond to them in an empathetic way, you don't know how, what kind of effect that they can have on the next person. And so for me, that is a skill that it's not that I didn't know it, it's just that it became more clear during this pandemic. And because it, we, we were all thrown into a situation that we didn't ask for. And so we, to me, I felt like you have no choice but to learn how to be a little bit more empathetic toward people. I love that, that you actually, first of all, you, great shout out for empathy. We have a previous on-demand Leading with Empathy webinar on the website. All of our webinars are on demand. So go check that one out to follow up on what Cheryl's saying. Um, I think the other thing, Cheryl, too, the, the listening, especially through technology, when you're in the room with someone, you can't be on your phone, you can't be emailing, like they're going to see that that's happening. But when you're behind the camera, you're a little bit shielded in a way that you mm -hmm. could potentially tune out, or even, you know, whatever's going on around you, whether it's like kids or dogs, you know, whatever. I think that that's such a great, honestly overlooked skill, I think, coming out of this. So I'm really glad that you called that out. I think that that's something that everyone, every professional and probably personally should be working to develop the active listening and, and the empathy piece. I think that's really great. So what are some of the other things? So those are both the, the active listening, the, the self, the compassion, those are wonderful skills and, and good takeaways for people watching today. But what are some other things that you can think of, not necessarily for you personally that you learned, mm -hmm. but even through your teams, through your leaders, through anyone around you, what are some other skills people should be thinking about you know, developing as they're going forward. This was a, a very big change in everyone's life, but it doesn't mean it's going to be the last big change. So being prepared for that next one, what are some skills you would recommend people take some time to think about and develop? 
And Stephanie, I'll, I'll go to you on that. Um, I think overall, those soft skills are really what's so important. Um, you know, prior to speaking for this engagement, I kind of looked up like, what are the key things that employers are looking for um, when hiring and things like that. And so I, I found this uh, LinkedIn global talent trend report. And it was saying that 89% of recruiters are saying when someone doesn't work out in an interview, it comes down to the lack of soft skills. And so mm -hmm. those skills are really critical in this new environment. And I also think new, um, the, the younger generations coming into this environment are also looking for those skills in their leaders, that it's not just about the pay, but it's about their overall well-being. Um, at their place of employment, that they're not looking to just um, come in and do their job, but they want to make sure that you're doing things for the community, that you're doing things for their well-being, that you actually don't just say we care about work-life balance, but you do, in, in fact, show it. You show it yourself as an example, and then you advocate that for your employees that you work with. And so I think that is a huge thing. I think there's been a lot of hot topics on, you know, work-life balance and things like that. And hey, are you ever going to get it right? No, there are some weeks that I definitely don't have that balance, but I really try to show to my team. And anytime they're like, oh, I kind of want to take off, but maybe this, I'm like, no, you, you need to take the time. Like your kids are only going to be young for so long. If, and I will say to them, if my child's sick and they're home, you're not going to see me working or you're only going to see me working when they're napping. So I wouldn't expect anything different from you. And so I really support that with them. And I think as leaders, we need to make sure that even though we're using these words like, you know, DE and I and work life balance and well being and safe spaces, that we're not just saying those words, but we're really truly using them each and every day. And we continue to learn. So we need to continue to take classes, to read books. Um, as leaders, it's not just our job to come in and, you know, clock in and clock out, but we really need to continue to develop ourselves and set that example and show it to those people that we are working with so that we can all lift each other up at the end of the day. I love that. Leading by example. I, yeah, that's so key in order to have everyone around you know that that is, is the goal. So how about you, Cheryl? What are some skills you recommend? Um, definitely um, continuing with that, leading with by example, and also just basically communication, period. That's to me, that's just, that's the big thing to just continue because we all, we all are in this new wave era where everything is like, in a microwave, we, we, we quick to send out an email. And sometimes we may want to just pick up the phone because sometimes we, even though we may not mean something in a way that we said in an email when we're communicating, sometimes if you just pick up the phone, it would be better because, you know, if you're a blunt person, when you send an email, it may come out like that, even though you don't mean it. So I think communication to me has to be really huge ongoing. Um, leading by example. I mean, I'm a manager. If my employee says that they need to be at home, like, like Stephanie says, you know, you don't, you shouldn't, I want you to be comfortable with coming to me and saying my child is sick because if your child is sick, I don't want you to come to work. I want you to stay at home with your child. I've always been that type of person period anyway. Cause when I was, when I was a mom, I didn't really think I needed to ask. I'll just send you an email or call you. I'm staying at home. My baby has a hundred and fever. I'm not coming to work. Mm -hmm. And even now in our time, we, most of us always work over, usually work over our 40 hours. That's just realistic sometimes. But since you've been at home and even going forward, now we know how important time is to us and how short it is. When you get off work, you need to stay off work. You know, it'll be there tomorrow. It's really not going to go away. You know, take that time and just take off, let your people take off and don't, don't kill yourself because the reality of it is if something happens to you, you know, you, they're going to send you flowers, they're going to do this, but your job is going to be posted and somebody else is going to be there the next day. So take your time for you because you are the only person who can take care of you. And if you take care of you, you're going to be a better worker anyway, because you're going to be relaxed, you're going to be, you know, better headspace, your mood is going to be better. So I just think that it's definitely, the, to me, going forward, that needs to be one of the most important things to continue because everybody, most companies are all pushing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are beautiful words, but you need to act on them. It's more than just 
it, it's so much more behind that whole diversity, equity, and inclusion, but you need to act on it and believe it and just mm. make sure that you are living by example. Yeah, that's such a great answer, Cheryl. And I, being able to, to have your team understand that you're not just saying that, that you truly feel that. that I, I used to say to my team, it's like work should be the least important thing in your life. Like everything else is going on around you. Like this is, you know, we get, we have to work, but, and I just, I share, it's just, it's so clear as you're saying that, that you truly believe that and feel that. So I think that that's really great from a leadership perspective. I want to go to the comments because there are a couple things in here. One, I want to read what Erica said, because I think it's a great tip for people too. She starts, she does um, check-ins with her team every week. So that way she can understand where they are mentally before you're loading them up with work. And it also brings you closer as a team and it performs work and performances. I think Erica, that's a key point. And, and Cheryl, I know you hit on this as well. Taking vacation days, figuring out where someone's headspace is to not take on a project that day. That doesn't make people less productive. It makes them more productive because not only are they going to be in a better place when they come back from that vacation or from, you know, that mental health day to take on that work. They're also going to work, want to do that good work for a leader who is giving them that, that grace. Like there are people you will, people who will, will jump off a cliff for you. You know, they will be there to do that work when they know that they have that leader who supports them. So I think that's great advice, Erica. I want to go off script question wise for you guys. So I'll ask the question really slowly to give you time to prepare. Um, but Bonnie brings up a good point. So work-life balance has been a challenge for her because she seems to work more when she's at home. And I know we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier that you're sometimes afraid to step away from your computer during the work day. But I think for a lot of us too, without that delineation of I'm getting up from my desk, walking to my car and driving home, your work day doesn't feel like it stops. So what advice do you, other than, you know, I, I know Stephanie, you mentioned putting some me time on your calendar during the day, but as far as, you know, when your day starts, when your day ends, having that time to really schedule in a work day when you're working from home, do you guys have any advice for that on finding that work-life balance when you're working from home? And Stephanie, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I think one thing, which, you know, it's easier said than done, but um, for me and probably for a lot of people, like I have access to everything on my cell phone too. So I have even been caught on vacation where I'm responding to emails and things like that. So what I really tried to do is um, close everything so that I'm not getting like pop-ups constantly on my phone either, because that to me, like, and sometimes, yes, if I'm waiting in a line or I'm, you know, doing something, I think, okay, I can get a few things done in a couple minutes and um, get it done. But really, it's just the mind frame of it. Like you shouldn't always be turned on to your work. And so setting those parameters on when you can get notifications and when you can't is a big piece of it. Um, and I think if you're feeling like you're working too much, um, I think really like setting that time for yourself. Um, for me, like I do work a lot. I work sometimes late into the night. Um, I try not to send things to my team to make them see that I'm working at 10 p.m. on something <laughs> because they think I'm crazy. But I, when they say that to me, I never go, oh yeah, that's because I'm working all the time and I overwork. But what I really say is, you know what? I picked up my daughter. She had Girl Scouts. I ran her around. And so I wasn't there all day. And so that was kind of the finish of my day. So I think you really need to take, um, it's an internal assessment of how you feel. If you feel like it's too much, then you need to like get calendars, put yourself in there to make sure that you're cutting it off. Don't get notifications, shut your phone off, shut your teams off, whatever you need to do to kind of get that work to stop. Because I can get a little bit addicted to it too. We all have our cell phones by us nonstop. And so if you're getting notifications, it's only natural to respond. You know, I mean, if I get a text message, I'm trying to respond to it. So why wouldn't I do the same thing if I see an email coming through? Um, so I think, you know, just really trying to put those limits on it to get you out of the habit. I mean, shoot, lock your phone. And what do they have? Those little like lock boxes now with the timers <laughs> on it. I don't know if they have a big enough one for your computer, but, you know, lock it, lock it up. Don't let you, don't go on it. Don't look at it. How about you, Cheryl? Any advice for kind of finding that balance at home? A couple of things that I would, I uh, would suggest if you, if you came from an environment where you were going to work every day and you were thrown back into working, working at home. I would suggest, you know, get up in the morning like you actually are going to work, get up, get get completely dressed and not just, oh, I'm at home. Let me just put on this shirt and some pajamas. Get up, get completely fully dressed down to the shoes, 
fix your breakfast, do everything you would normally do if you were going to get up and walk out that door. Mm -hmm. And that way, your to me, your mind frame will be, okay, well, I got to go to work today. Get on your computer, do your work at lunch, leave your phone, work for, leave your work phone at your desk. Do not take your work phone to lunch with you because as a, as a person who normally works and wants to make sure they respond timely, if you're at lunch, what are you going to do? You're going to look at that phone. You're going to answer that, that, that email or that text, leave your phone, go take your lunch break away from your desk. If you're at home, my suggestion is to leave out of that house apartment, wherever you stay, leave out of there and go take your lunch break, come back and have your time, go to work. When it's time for you to get off, get off work, turn everything completely off. No, like Stephanie said, no notifications, leave everything off. And if you think you're going to have that urge to go get your phone, I just want to see what's going on. I promise you it'll be there tomorrow. It's not going anywhere. And, and when you do feel that urge to answer that phone, maybe go onto a little meditation, do a little 10, 15 minute meditation to, mm -hmm. to, to clear and relax your mind and just stop that train of thought and just have that even if it's a minimum of only 10 minutes of meditation time for yourself, it'll calm you. It'll get your, your mind relaxed and stop. The work is not going anywhere. This is no me, no, by no means am I saying work is not important, but I promise you it will be there tomorrow and whatever they needed answered in that few minutes that you that thought you was going to make a difference, it will be there tomorrow and you will have time to answer it. You have to make time for yourself and just stop because it's easy to be at home and be like, oh, I'm at home. I'm in a zone. I'm going to work all night. Don't do that. Yeah. And I, I, oh, oh I was just going to say, and as like adjuster, especially in the adjuster realm, I, I mean, the, the work is always there. Correct. And sometimes I feel like, you know, like mine is I work until the work is done. Like that's my work ethic. I just keep working and I, you know, I get it finished. Um, I do not think like a, I have a lot of newer employees coming in now, younger generation, and that is not how they are working. Um, you know, even like studying for ongoing education and stuff, they're like, yeah, I'm great. I want to do that, but I want to do it within my work time because my work time is my work time and my life is my life. So mm -hmm. I think younger generations are really finding their boundaries and being able to express those a lot easier. Um, I have a lot more of like the guilt that it's not done or the mom guilt that I didn't spend enough time. And so I'm trying to juggle it all. Um, but I think, you know, younger generations coming into this industry are really putting better boundaries on the fact that work is work and life is life. And I'm not going to spend all my time working. Um, and, and the other thing with that being just that, um, you need to feel, and hopefully most people do feel like they have leadership that they can say, hey, this is not work that I can get done within my work week. If 40 hours is your work week and you're finding yourself working 50 hours every week, I strongly encourage, and hopefully you have a mentor or a leader that you can talk to and say, what can we do about this? Is there efficiencies? Is there job sharing? Something, because you really someone needs to know about that. If they don't know about it, they're just going to keep giving you that work. I, and again, I'm not going to be able to promise that it'll change, but I feel like you'll feel better for saying like, I work really hard and I want to be able to work the hours that I work, but I don't want to be given too much. I don't want to be taken advantage of either. So advocating for yourself, you're going to be the best advocate for yourself and what you can exactly. do. There's, there's so much that you guys said that I love so much. And I don't even know if I'm able to get to all of it in the time we have left, but <laughs> Advocating for yourself, I think is fantastic. I also think that's a great topic that we could talk about for a long time. And that's definitely something that I think people could, could really resonate with the takeaways from that. But um, the, the boundaries, I think is really important, making sure that you're setting those yourself and figuring out what that is and having that opportunity to have that conversation with your leader. And I appreciate Cheryl, you gave a shout out to an old webinar we did. Stephanie, you gave a shout out to our next one, which is going to be about how you find your mentors and your board of, of directors. So if anyone on the call is doesn't have a mentor yet, make sure you attend that one and then we can go from there. And that's a great question to then talk to your mentor about. And then Cheryl, with you, the, the meditation piece, I think that's really great. And that actually leads into a question that I have for both of you as well, is that these skills we're talking about, what are some resources or some opportunities that, you know, so if someone is listening and like in particular meditation, Cheryl, you know, that's not something people just know how to do necessarily. What are some resources or some opportunities or some ways, whether it is recommending a podcast, a book, or just personal development skills for people to develop these skills we've been talking about for this hour. So Cheryl, I'll go to you first. 
Um, there, there's a Calm app that um, if anybody has like, of course, Androids, most everybody has Androids or iPhones, you can download the Calm app. If anyone has a Peloton um, or Peloton membership, that the Peloton app is more than just the bike. They actually have a whole section of meditation and it has like mm -hmm. sleep meditation. It has five minute energizing work. Med it has different meditations for morning work, evening. I mean, I've even used it to just to help me relax before I go to sleep because sometimes you do need your mind to calm down before you go to bed. It's like a 10 minute, it can be 10, 15, however many minutes you choose, but different apps that will help you do that to, to do that. And, and sometimes it's just as simple as just, you know, even just learning to just stop and just take short, long, I mean, take long, deep breaths and just relax because it, it's just all about a, a state of being relaxed. But those are some, some of the apps that I would use um, to, 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 to start, to get started because it's, everybody doesn't know how to meditate, but it's not, it's not anything that's going to be a drastic thing to learn. It definitely will be, it definitely will help you to, to, to relax. Mm -hmm. And Veronica mentioning in the chat, EAP programs as well. I think that's a really great call out your company is. is paying for EAP and people don't really take advantage of, of all the opportunities that are there within it. So great call out Veronica. You know, if anyone has questions for your particular company on what is offered through that. I think that's a wonderful call out. And there's Stuff usually, there's usually the first three visits of those are usually free. And then uh, since she did bring that up, some companies have like free, free gym memberships or free gym memberships or discounts. Take advantage of those, those, mm -hmm. those uh, amenities that your company offers, because some of those gym memberships, they have yoga classes, beginning yoga classes, beginning meditation classes, take advantages of those memberships that your employer that you're working all these extra hours for um, allows you to do and take advantage of that so you can be in a better space. Some also have random discounts like restaurants and yes. food. I mean, go out to eat, take yourself out to yes. dinner and with a discount from working for your company. So yeah, there's a lot you can find on there. So great call out, Veronica. And Stephanie, how about you? Yeah, I think the key to it really is about finding what helps you, what you benefit from, how do you relax, what makes you feel good. So I'll be real honest. I, and and I have tried it numerous times. I have not found a real love for meditation or yoga yet. I'm kind of a more active, engaging. I like to talk. In fact, I did hot yoga once and I fell asleep and I woke up snoring in the class. So I mean, <laughs> these things, these things I struggle with a little bit, but I will say like the key is, is keep trying, like try new things. So LinkedIn learning, I mean, there's a ton of things on LinkedIn where you can watch short videos um, podcast. I'm a really weird person when I listen to things. If the tone of someone's voice isn't something that I jive with it, I just have to move on. Like if the podcast isn't resonating with you, search for another one. I mean, you can just simply search subject line. Honestly, I, to me, like relaxing, I go to the gym and I listen to true crime podcasts. Like that's, <laughs> that's my <laughs> way that I relax and like do my thing. Um, but I've also done Zumba. I've done work classes where you dance. It's about, for me, it's just about letting go and not having all the other things on my mind. It's, you know, sometimes when I'm in those Zumba classes and stuff, you're trying to learn the steps, you're trying to keep up, you like the music. And so I'm not thinking about work or stress or home or any of the other things going on. I'm just focused on the class and enjoying it. So the big thing is, is find things that work for you. Mm -hmm. And if you try right. something and it doesn't work, don't try feel like else. that's it. Yeah. Try a book, try a podcast. Um, I have some really neat um, books that I've gotten. I have this book. I don't know if you can see it, but it's called mm -hmm. 75 plus team building activities um, for remote teams. It's simple ways to build trust, strength, and communication laugh together from afar by Christopher Littlefield. And it's nice because it's like a one page idea. It gives you the amount of time you need. And so it's just fun things that you can try. But to me, it's all about like trying and experimenting and just finding what really works, like what brings joy to you and to the people around you. I think that's great. And I see Nikki in the chat asking for fellow runners. And so I agree with you, Stephanie, that I lose, I start thinking about a workout versus work. And so I moved here to Jersey from only living in the Midwest. It's very hilly outside of the Midwest. And so all of my runs, I'm just like, I hate this. This is so hard. I hate this so much. And I'm not thinking about work at all. I'm just thinking about how much I hate all the hills that I now have to run. <laughs> to. So it really is true. You find those things like Donna saying, gardening, baking, cooking a recipe. If you're focusing on the recipe and what you need to add and your ingredients, you're not thinking about everything going on 
it works. So I think those are just such great things. Like you said, Stephanie, find what works for you and it's going to take your mind off of it. So, and I will say too, different seasons in your life will require you that they will require different things. You know, I'm not saying I've tried yoga throughout my life. I've tried meditation several times. Sometimes it is beneficial. Sometimes it's not. I ran, I ran half marathons at this point in my life. I'm not at that point where I can be committed to that. That would cause me more stress. So, um, you know, just, you have to always be open and know that if something doesn't work now, it could work in five years from now. You just don't know. So. I, uh, I love Nikki's com- uh, Nikki Forte's comment. <laughs> walk and virtual marathons. I will run if the zombie apocalypse comes. So yeah, we'll all, we'll all be running together then. Um, Veronica mentioning HelloFresh. I love HelloFresh. That is my favorite home delivery of a uh, you know that genre of getting your food. I think everything is so delicious. They have wonderful vegetarian options through that one. So I they totally do. agree. Um, so to close this, I, this conversation has been really wonderful and you can tell the engagement in the chat. I do want to thank everyone who is watching this live. Your engagement today has been absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's, I think it's also a, a huge tribute to you, Stephanie and Cheryl, the, the comments you're making and the way you're answering these questions is leading to really great engagement. So I've, I've had so much fun with this today, but to close it out, any final pieces of advice or strategies or just any helpful tips that you want to leave our members with talking about how you can either adapt to a new environment or just going forward. If something like this happens again, how do we know we're going to be in a good place when it happens? And so Cheryl, I'll start with you on that. My tip is, is it's okay to be self. It's okay to be selfish. And when I say that it's okay to put yourself first and not feel bad about it, period. I mean, that's, that's just the reality. It's okay to be selfish for yourself because you have to take care of you. And to me, different things that you go through in your life that brings you to whatever point you may be in in your life, different scenarios that you've gone through, different experiences that you've dealt with um, throughout your life help shape you and they help determine how you see things. And so for me, and I'm going to speak for me, learning to be selfish is okay. And I've accepted that. I don't feel, I don't feel guilty if I say no, or if I don't do this, I have learned to be okay with being selfish. And I would recommend anybody on here. It's okay to be selfish and put yourself first and take care of you. Love it. Totally agree. Stephanie, how about you? (laughs) I think something that I've really tried to be mindful of is really looking at the people that you surround yourself with, that you spend your most time with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody's probably heard you're the sum of the average, you know, the five people that you surround yourself with, that's your, you know, what you end up being like. So if you're finding yourself in a place where you're not feeling elevated. I mean, to me, the Alliance has been something where I have found so much purpose and belonging and inspiration. It's made me want to do more, try harder. This is my first panel discussion. So, I mean, I'm doing things that are out of my comfort zone that I'm excited to be a part of. And so I just encourage you know, reach out. Maybe if you've got a question or a concern and you usually go to, you know, so-and-so, try a different person. Um, Try to ask someone else, build those friendships because you never know like where that's going to lead you, you know, just opportunity, stress, well-being, all of that. Um, The more people you surround yourself that, again, you can lift each other up, the, the better you'll be. Yeah. And so first panel for both of you, but not your last. So everyone, all of our members, (laughs) you guys will be seeing them again soon. Um, And on that with the Alliance. So I'll go along with what uh, Nikki said in the comments, which is shameless plug for the Alliance book club. That's a great (laughs) way to get involved with the Alliance and to meet other people and to have this, like Stephanie said, to have this community around you. And then for Stephanie Anderson in the chat, being new to the work comp world, great way to start meeting people in the industry. So Thank you guys so much, Cheryl, Stephanie, for being here. Thank you everyone in the chat, everyone who joined today for just being so engaged and having just a topic where it just felt like a really good conversation with friends and could not have planned that better. You could not have been better panelists. So thank you, Cheryl and Stephanie, both so much. And for everyone else, this will be on demand. So tell your friends so they can come back and uh, be a part of this wonderful conversation we had. So thank you to everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.